Nine minutes past the hour here on the NorCal Sports Report on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. And I'm joined today by the great Jesse Naylor, host of Last Second Sports. Jesse, what's going on, man? Thank you for coming on. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me on, Andre. I do find it ironic that you have a sponsor called Seal the Deal, which is exactly what the 49ers are not doing. And why we are in this situation where the San Francisco 49ers are five and five. Don't you find the irony in that just a little I, bit? I, I really do. And, and and it's funny because it's the one thing they, they can't do. They can't seem to seal the deal. Maybe they have to buy some of uh, Cecilia B's wax seals. Maybe that will you know spark <laughs> some uh, uh, inspiration to, to close out these games. But it's yeah. one of their biggest problems. And I'm going to pull up a stat right now, uh, right here. When I read this, I was like, geez, you got to be kidding me. The Bengals and the Niners are the top two teams that have allowed the most points in the last two minutes of the fourth quarter. Now, not to mention, how many 10-point leads have the Niners got going into the fourth quarter? And it never feels safe. It never feels secure. And it goes back all the way to the Super Bowls. They've always seemed to blow a 10-point lead. And that's been one of their biggest problems. But this stat alone, if the Niners were able to win those games those games in which they lost to Seattle, the Rams, Cardinals, they they had a chance to be eight and two. But it makes me wonder if they did win those games and they were eight and two, it almost feels like they would be pretenders at this point. They'd be a team that's heavily flawed, but somehow stumbled their way into eight and two, sort of like the uh the Philadelphia Eagles of last year. Where once we played them and we exposed them, then they completely fell apart. So maybe it's a good thing that we're five and five. But it just seems like, why can't we just seal that deal and hold that lead through the fourth quarter? I mean, Jesse, I mean, you watch the Niners more than I do, and I watch it a lot. What are they doing wrong, or what do they need to do in order to protect these leads and, and, and secure these wins? I mean, this is kind of a uh, a microcosm of Kyle Shanahan, right? There's, I'm going to give you a couple stats of my own real quick. Okay, go ahead. San Francisco 49ers are the first team since 2000 to lose three division games while leading by four or more in the fourth quarter. Kyle Shanahan, out of 125 qualified coaches with at least 40 games decided by seven points or less, ranks 118th in win percentage. So now when you look at that in totality and then bring that to this season, it's not really that big of a surprise. It's just now the 49ers for the first time are playing in these tight games. The rest of the league does this, Andre. The rest of the league plays in close games. The 49ers are used to front running and blowing teams out. That's mm -hmm. how they've been the years that they've made these pushes. Not a lot of close games, which is why when you look at like fourth quarter comebacks, you know, Jimmy Garoppolo, Brock Purdy, they don't have a lot because they're not in that situation very often. And for the first time ever, the 49ers are continuously in that situation. You look at a team like the Chiefs that find a way to win most of those games because mm -hmm. they're in it pretty regularly. And you've got a team like the 49ers that are not at all used to this. And so they're a fish out of water. They don't know how to win these close games. It really is an art. And mm -hmm. also, this is when close games usually happen sometime in the playoffs, late in the playoffs, Super Bowl. And that's why they continue to falter. It's just... They haven't mastered that art of winning the close game because they really haven't had to. And that's what I think we're seeing on display here. But do you think it's a matter of it's it's on Kyle Shanahan? Or is this something that it, it's the whole team? Is it Brock Purdy? What is it about these close games that we can't seem to win? Yeah, I mean, it's it's here's the other thing is is a game is four four quarters, mm -hmm. right? I know that we want to look at, at the fourth quarter and and the 49ers give up more points. Than anybody else, you know, the other than the Bengals in the fourth quarter, or the final couple minutes of the game, what have you, the last drive. But if they had taken care of business up until that point, it really wouldn't have mattered. How many missed opportunities did they have this last Sunday, for example, where they had a first down or a big gain? It got called back due to a penalty. The week before, they missed multiple field goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's blame on everybody. Kyle Shanahan, you look at some of the play calls, they're wonky, some of the decisions he makes. Like he'll get the ball back with a minute and a half before halftime and and totally take his foot off the gas. But when he gets it with 24 seconds left and inside his own 25, he's like, yeah, let's go for it. <laughs> but then everything he calls is a deep route. It's like, well, 
you're probably going to throw a pick, if anything, here. You're not doing anything safe. His decision-making is erratic to me. Brock mm -hmm. Purdy certainly isn't doing him any favors. He's missing a lot of underneath throws, throws that Brock Purdy would have made in the past. He's passing those up all year long. Um, the defense obviously is struggling. I mean, really, this is a this is a team downfall. But ultimately, Kyle's responsible for it all. And I think Kyle, a lot of the times, is looked at as an offensive coordinator where he'll get these passes from the fan base because they'll say something like, well, the offense is doing their job. That's what Kyle's here to do. Hold on a second. Yeah. Is Kyle the offensive coordinator of this team, Andre, or is he the head coach of this team? Because if he's the head coach, then special teams problems are on Kyle. Defensive problems are on Kyle. Personnel problems are on Kyle. And vice versa, if those things are going well, he deserves all the credit in the world. A lot of times, though, we look at him like an offensive coordinator and we judge him, oh, he should be fired because the offense isn't doing well. Or, oh, he should be coach of the year because the offense is doing its job. He's the head coach of this team, ultimately, and, and he's judged too often like an offensive coordinator. Well, and, and I would agree that when we look at Kyle Shanahan, we always look at the offense. How's the offense doing? Is the offense looking impeccable? Is the offense looking, is it looking uh, innovative? All this stuff. But in reality, all the aspects of a team falls on his shoulders. Mm -hmm. And to me, it all starts this year when Ronnie Bell dropped that pass against the Rams. Now, look, Ronnie Bell, I'm sure he's a great guy. And, and, and you know, he's fighting for his job, you know, so. But as a fan, you drop that pass. My first reaction was you got to cut him and make an example of, hey, look, if you cost us a game and you played the way he played, we can't just keep you on. But he didn't do that. He kept him. So I said, okay, that's a little weird. And mind you, this whole season, I've been a big supporter of Kyle Shanahan. But these little things just keep happening where I'm like, okay, he, I don't know why he kept Ronnie Bell, but okay, that's fine. He's a player, you know, whatever. And then you have all the, the, the mistakes on special teams. And Brian Schneider is still there. And so if you allow these mistakes, you allow all these things to happen, but you're not holding anyone accountable, then to me it feels like the players – Aren't gonna, they're not going to hold themselves accountable. Like, well, look, I mean, they're screwing up left and right. You got Debo Samuel getting in a fight with uh, Tabor Pepper saying, you know, as he tells uh, uh, Jake Moody to lock in because there's so many mistakes happening and no one's holding anyone accountable. So with that being said, I think this is the first year where I would say I believe Kyle Shanahan's job is on the line. And I think he's on the hot seat right now based on how they are performing. And not only that, the fact that you have a guy like Ben Johnson out there who may be available as your head as a head coach at the end of this year. And you look at what the Lions are doing right now. The Lions are just they're tearing everyone apart. I mean, they're running up the score. And it's incredible to see what their offense is doing. It looks innovative. And so having said that, it's like, look, he can focus on the offense all he wants. But at the same time, he has to focus on all aspects of the game. And this is the first year in a while where it seems like the Niners are never playing four quarters of football. They'll play two quarters and then a bad third quarter, bad fourth quarter. Good first half, bad first half. You know, bad first half, good second half. It's just you never get a full four quarters of good football. And that's something that's been really bothering me. And so it's one of those things where you start to ask yourself, is it the team? Or is it the leadership? And is this the, the year where if the Niners don't make the playoffs, are they going to move on from Kyle Shanahan? I don't I don't think they're going to move on from Kyle. I, I don't. I think that Jed York loves Kyle. I think maybe a little <laughs> bit too much. Um, I, I definitely think if they don't make the playoffs, he should at least be on the hot seat going into next year. And we'll see yes. how next year goes. But... Here's the interesting thing. When it when it comes to Kyle Shanahan and it comes to coaches like Ben Johnson, I, I love Ben Johnson. I've been talking about Ben Johnson for two years. Right? Mm -hmm. This is like year number three. I've been hyping this guy up. Love Ben Johnson. But there's a lot that comes with trading out of Kyle Shanahan for Ben Johnson. First of all, there's no guarantee Ben Johnson wants to come here. There's no guarantee if, if Joe Burrow's available. Hell, if Caleb Williams in division is available, you might want to go with those guys. I'm not saying mm -hmm. that Caleb Williams is better than Brock Purdy by any means. Joe Burrow certainly is. 
but the upside of Caleb Williams, the the lack of pressure, so to speak, in Chicago versus coaching a 49er team that's expected to win a Super Bowl, that's an easier proposition for Ben Johnson, in my opinion. And I, I think a better option. You you look at the 49ers realistically, right now, they've got cap situations coming up. They've got a decision they got to make on Brock Purdy. They've got a lot of aging good players. There's a lot yeah. to is a new guy. I don't know if I'm excited to take this job. Especially if they do fire Kyle. Now we look at it as fans say, okay, well, look, look firing Kyle, I get it. Maybe his message worth then. They they went eight and nine. They didn't make the playoffs in a year that we expected them to win a Super Bowl. All, I get all of that. But as a as a coach looking in at the situation, you're going, hold on a second. This guy took you to two Super Bowls, mm -hmm. four conference championships, and he has one season where he doesn't meet expectations finally, and you fire him? I don't want to be there. So I, it makes it really, really tough to just fire Kyle Shanahan. Mm -hmm. I definitely think he should be criticized, held accountable, all those things. I just don't personally think they're going to fire Kyle. And, I, and here's the other issue. The question comes in because I know a lot of 49er fans look at Kyle Shanahan and they say, hey, Kyle Shanahan's the issue, but I love Brock Purdy. Let's just get him a new coach. Imagine what he would do with Ben Johnson. Well, what if Ben Johnson doesn't want uh, Brock Purdy? Yeah, what if he's like, I want someone like Joe Burrow. Let's get rid of this guy. You know, you I never want know. my own guy. Yeah, exactly. So that's the other thing. There's no guarantee. And then if you're if you're going to force Brock Purdy on the next guy, then you're not necessarily going to get the best coach. And so the issue becomes bigger than what it needed to be. So as much as, I, listen, I think there's guys out there I would love to get, multiple coaches that I like. I don't think that the 49ers are going to fire Kyle unless something pops off between him and the front office or if the right. players are just coming forward saying, listen, we can't win with this guy. We're over it. It would take something big more than just a losing season and missing the playoffs, in my opinion, for, for them to fire him. I wouldn't be shocked, though, if they moved on from John Lynch if the team goes 8-9 and nine or something like that this year. I think they definitely need to get uh, or invest more money into their coaching staff, especially a defensive coordinator. I don't think Nick Sorensen has really been the answer all year. Now, look, a lot of us have been giving him time because, you know, obviously there were stats that said that, oh, you know, uh, Robert Sala and D'Amico Ryans had rough starts their year, but then they rebounded in the second half. But so far, we haven't seen that. In fact, uh, there was a quote by uh, Brian Baldinger, Baldy, saying, opposed to Steve Spagnuolo uh, and some of these other teams in this league, there are good blitzing teams. They just don't know how to get a free hit on the quarterback. They just don't dial it up. They don't overload. They don't disguise. So they're pretty bland in what they do. And I, I think even to just the average fan, they can see that you, you don't see a lot of blitzes from Nick Sorensen. I think you did see it in the previous game against Baker Mayfield. On the last drive, he kept sending blitzes at Baker Mayfield. And you saw a difference. Baker had to throw you know, under pressure. But in this game, we didn't see it again. Now, granted, Nick Bosa wasn't in the game, but you, you can't just... You can't live off of Nick Bosa. Like, oh, well, if Bosa's out, we're fucked. You can't do that. you got to be able to put pressure on that quarterback and be innovative in how you do that. So I definitely think Nick Sorensen is not the answer. Um, and, and now he's making Steve Wilkes look like a, a, a top-flight defensive coordinator. He, and that's ironic in itself because we were like, get him out of here. And now we got Sorensen who doesn't look as good. But let's talk about Brock Purdy. Now, Brock Purdy was 21 of 28 for 159 yards, a touchdown, and one interception. He had an 85.3 quarterback rating. Now, he looked good at times, but this was probably one of his weaker games. Offensively, this was this was one of the weakest games of the year in, in total yardage for the 49ers all season. You know, you had mentioned during the game in a tweet, or I should say a post, uh, that J.P. Mason, he had the he had that one carry where he looked explosive. He was making cuts. He was getting positive yardage, and then we didn't see him again. And every time we hand the ball off to Christian McCaffrey, I love Christian McCaffrey, but I just didn't see that explosiveness that I saw from a season, a player that's that that's gone through, what, 10 weeks of football, in J.P. Mason, and yet they want to keep McCaffrey out there. He had 19 carries for 79 yards. 
He also had, uh, where is it? He had four catches for 27 yards. It just seems like Kyle does not want to mix in Mason or Garendo when McCaffrey is there. And, and, and why is that, do you think? It doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. But it was completely predictable. I mean, we had. We had every, everyone. Everyone knew it was coming. Everyone's. Like, yeah, we knew. We knew it. it was coming. It was it's a big topic of conversation before CMC came back, and everybody hoped, like, okay, here's here's what a split should look like, and everybody had their percentages, like fifty percent <laughs> CMC, thirty yep. percent JP, twenty percent Garendo, or sixty thirty ten, or whatever the number was. You know what I mean? Uh, so everybody had their, their favorable split and Kyle's like, uh, uh-huh, uh, uh, uh-huh, uh-huh. all right. 99, one, that's yeah. it. That's your split. And the one goes to Debo, just so you yeah. know, it's not going to Mason, but I, 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 don't, I don't understand it. I really don't. And he is clearly not himself. And even if he was himself as a 28 year old running back at this stage in his career, why not look at what the lions are doing? Can he yeah. not play the Jameer Gibbs role? 10 carries a game. Exactly. Eight targets a game. What's wrong with that? Why can't he do that? That, you know, th- those routes that um, they've got three wide receivers, uh, him and, and Juice on the field. How about just take Juice off the field, put Mason on the field, and put him on the field together? Why can't you do that? I, I yeah. just, this whole thing doesn't make any sense to me. It, his, when you look at Kyle, when I look at this game, I had multiple issues with the personnel groupings. I had multiple issues with the route concepts. Uh, I don't know how many times you look at it and they've got like a first and 10 and you've got three routes being ran and they're all like 17 to 25 yards downfield. Like what, what are you supposed to do with that? Like, where's the, where's the creativity? You're running three clear out routes and then you've got one guy leaking out of the backfield and going towards the sideline. It's like, well, wouldn't you run like a mesh concept, a crossing route, something underneath? as you're pulling these linebackers away, but none of that. And then when Brock Purdy does have something, he's so hesitant because he's probably not used to having anything. And mm-hmm. it's just, it just everything is so complicated for this team. I don't understand it. I've never watched this team struggle so much to put up points. It is so bizarre to watch. And they have it is. enough talent. They have enough talent. I'm they sorry. Have, they're loaded with talent. I mean, obviously, look, yeah, you're down Javon Hargrave. And, and this week, you're probably going to be down Nick Bosa as well. Uh, you're hoping to get back Drake Greenlaw, which if if they continue to lose, I, maybe he doesn't even come back this year. But I think uh, if you're if you're shooting for a game to come, for him to come back, it'd be either against Buffalo or at home against Chicago. I think at home against Chicago is the right you know game to kind of pencil him back in but but we'll see what they do um but it, it's it, it doesn't make any sense because this team is so loaded with talent it almost feels like the the rest of the league has caught up with the Kyle Shanahan offense because it doesn't seem to be fooling anybody now you could argue well they didn't ha- they didn't have Christian McCaffrey in this last game they didn't have uh George Kittle but you have to be able to overcome the loss of your tight end. You have to be able to overcome the loss of your running back when you have all these other weapons at your disposal. We talk about Debo Samuel. He had one carry for negative one yards. It's like, whoa, dude, come on. And on top of that, his jet sweeps have not looked the same since like 2022. He can't turn that corner. He doesn't have that that elusive ability that he once had. Um, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's just, you know, time has kind of caught up with him because, you know, when it comes to football players, after about four or five years, they do start to slow down. I don't know. But let me ask you, when it comes to Brock Purdy, do you think so far, is this the guy that you want to invest your money into? Like you want to give him the contract and stick with him? Or is this the guy that you're saying, hey, you know what? Maybe not, maybe not yet. Because, I mean, you figure he could play, you know, he could play his fourth year. They could franchise him. You know, they have some options. If you're GM of the Niners, where which way are you leaning towards when it comes to Brock Purdy? Well, this offseason, I'm going to offer him something like Baker Mayfield contract. Mm-hmm. And I know he's not going to take it, and that's fine. And then I'm going to play it out. I'm going to force him to prove that he is that guy. Here's the problem. <clears throat> it. What do you risk if you don't pay him this next year? The only thing that you can potentially risk is that you pay him slightly more money the year after. 
So right. let's say let's say the going rate is sixty million dollars this offseason. Well, the salary cap's going to go up a little bit. He plays really good. He proves he's the franchise guy. So what's the going rate next offseason? Sixty two million, sixty three million. I would rather pay two three million extra per year and know for a fact I have the guy versus rushing to pay somebody that ends up not being the guy. Because if he ends up not being the guy and you've given him all that money, you've taken away any possibility of winning. And most likely he's not that guy. I'm not saying he can't get there. Of course he can get there. He's only in year three. But, I mean, there's only five to seven elite quarterbacks in the NFL at a time. The chances of him reaching that status based off of what we know, pretty slim to none. He looks closer to Baker than he does Josh Allen. And there's nothing well, wrong with that. I think Baker's a good quarterback, but I'm not paying Baker 60 million. I'm not paying Dak 60 million. I'm not paying Kyler 60 million or Kirk Cousins. I'm paying him about 45 million and I'm feeling good about it. Well, I I would agree. I, I mean, when you compare him to like Baker Mayfield, I think Baker has a stronger arm than he does. So that's that's one thing that separates the two of them. Now, I think Brock is is his athletic ability to run with the football. I think has has been a game changer not only for the Niners but for for him as a uh, as a product. As you know, his value has gone up because of his ability to, to run with the football. But to me, he's running an awful lot lately, which kind of seems like at first everyone thought, "Hey, this is this is great." He's a mobile quarterback now, but then after a while, you're like, wait a minute. Why is he running so much? Why is nobody getting open? Why are we last in in separation for the receivers? You know, there's all these things that are kind of adding up to why things are happening the, the way they're happening. Now, I would agree 45 million sounds great because if he is the equivalent of Baker Mayfield, then yeah. Now, I think he's done some incredible things, but obviously, look, he's not Josh Allen. Josh Allen's incredible. He's Josh Allen's like what six five or whatever. He's he could run with the football. He could throw the ball, you know, like a cannon. And he freaking ran to win the game against the Chiefs. And I was yeah. like, well, there you go. And then obviously you have Pat Mahomes, but I would say Mahomes is like the Steph Curry of football, or just having. And, and this is the thing too, is that when you watch teams, I don't care if it's basketball, if it's baseball, if it's football, when you watch teams that have an elite superstar. Such as like a Steph Curry, LeBron James, Josh Allen, Pat Mahomes, they can take over a game. They can dictate what happens. The the it's never too big for them. You know what I mean? They can overcome whatever is in front of them. And now, am I saying that Brock Purdy can't? No, I'm not saying that. But these guys are at an elite level. Now, here's the thing: is that the Niners struck gold by getting him with the last pick oh, in the draft. Man. I mean, that's huge. If we drafted this guy with like the tenth pick in the draft, everyone would be like, "Yeah, this is the, this is probably what you get. This is on par as first round draft pick. That's great." But being mystery relevant, I mean, this was like money in the bank. Holy cow! And they were and they really needed to win that Super Bowl last year, and unfortunately, they did not. And I thought Brock Purdy played really well in the Super Bowl. There was nothing he did that I thought was like, "Oh, come on, dude." That last play, obviously, you know, when you have the massive person of Chris Jones running at you unblocked, I mean, that's, you, you got to react quick to that. But I still think that Brock Purdy, unless you have a viable option to me, I would bring him back. But yes, I would agree that 45 million to me sounds right. And I would agree that at this point, based on what he's done this year, because I mean, face it, in sports, it's what have you done for me lately? And so I would say, hey, look, this is what I'm going to give you. If you don't like that, then we'll have you play on, on your fourth year, and we can also franchise you as well. So we have we have control of you for at least another couple of years. I don't feel like there's a need to rush into a fat contract with this guy. And I'm a huge Brock Purdy fan. Don't get me wrong. No, I agree with that. But that, it's not just – this is where 49ers get really frustrated with this conversation is obviously – we cover, you cover NorCal sports, you know, mm -hmm. 49ers, you cover everything, right? But I, I cover just the 49ers. But if you ask my opinion about CJ Stroud, let's say CJ Stroud was in a situation that he had to be paid at the end of this year. I love CJ Stroud. He was my number one pick last year. I thought it was clear. Mm -hmm. I don't understand what people saw on Bryce Young, but that's a whole different that's story. A, yeah. But I love CJ Stroud. 
everything he's brought, I feel like he's got all the tools. He's got everything that you need to be great in this league. He showed it last year. He brought a team and the Texans that had no business making the playoffs, all those things. But CJ's struggling a little bit this year. Yeah. So if if CJ was in the same situation as Brock and he's not, you know, thankfully for the Texans, they don't have to worry about this. But if CJ was in the same situation, I'd be like, yeah, let, I want to see another year. Let me see another year. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that about a quarterback. Now, when you or any player for that matter, but when you say it about a, a player that a fan base is passionate about, they get really, really, really upset. They get really tied to this player emotionally. Yeah. And I, I don't care who you are. I, <laughs> I make this example all the time whenever you see two great quarterbacks go head to head, but we, we saw this on, I think it was Sunday night football. Was it uh, burrow and, and Herbert on Sunday night football? Yeah. If I remember correctly, I don't know who in their right mind is watching that game and watching what those quarterbacks did. And then sits back and says to themselves, you know what I really want? I want a six foot quarterback who anticipates his butt off with a weak arm. That's what I really like. I mean, these guys are great. I, I love 6'6", rocket arm, mobile accuracy. I love all of that. But you know what? It's the cerebral guy that I really want. Well, who says that? This Nobody is athletics, that. man. I'm sorry. At some point, bigger, stronger, faster plays when you are in athletics. And Brock Purdy will never have bigger, strong. Now, he does have quickness. So the faster thing does play. But bigger, stronger, he will never have. And that's okay. doesn't mean he can't be good. Or even great, but in order to be great, you have to be something that nobody else has seen. A lot of people make the comparisons to Drew Brees, which stature-wise, athletic-wise, great comparisons. <laughs> Drew Brees is the most accurate passer of all time. Mm -hmm. In order for Drew Brees to be put into that category, he had to be the best in the world out of anybody who's ever done it to be put into that category. What does Brock do or show you that he can be the best in the world at it. Any one thing. And if you can name it and it means something when it comes to playing quarterback in the NFL, okay, maybe he can be that guy. I don't see it though. He doesn't have, I don't even think he's a top 10 passer as far as accuracy in this league. Completion percentage is not accuracy. Ball placement is accuracy. He struggles with ball placement. He does and he has. He's not elite at anything other than short area quickness and that's not enough to be an elite quarterback. He can be a good well, quarterback, but not elite. Well, I, I think he's shown the ability to, uh, in tight games and in and, and with big stakes, he can kind of rise that occasion. We saw in the playoffs how, how good he played when their backs were against the wall. So I think he has that kind of intangible. And I thought in the Super Bowl, he looked way better than he's looked in the past few games. Now, when we're talking about quarterbacks like a Josh Allen, I mean, these guys are – these guys are the spitting image of like a superhero if they actually existed. I mean, these guys have all the talent in the world. So to me, trying to compare these guys, trying to compare Brock to like, you know, a, a, a Josh Allen or a Pat Mahomes or CJ Stroud, you really can't because these guys are just at a more elite level. But I think that Brock has, obviously, we talk about, you know, his ability to to, to process uh, the defense, process, you know, his uh, his – Go, go through his progressions and all that. I think those are things that mentally a lot of quarterbacks can't do as well as Brock. Now, how does that translate? Well, we saw what he did last year. They had a phenomenal year. But this year, with a lot of the injuries, it, it, it hasn't panned out as well as all of us had hoped. And early on, he was actually leading the league in passing yards. So he does have really good stats. But to me, and it's weird to say this too, it's like I, I don't want to compare him to Josh Allen and these guys because these guys – these guys were born at a higher pedigree than he was. But I but at some point I guess you kind of have to if you're going to be paying him the kind of money that these guys would command. So it, it it's definitely a tough question. Um no, but this, I, I do want to say this go just to be clear about this. Just because you're a great athlete, bigger, stronger, faster, that's not enough. You do have to be cerebral as well. I mean, Anthony Richardson, we'll see what he ends up being. It's still early in his career, right? But <clears throat> we saw it with Trey Lance, a great example of this. You can have all those traits, but if you can't decide, you can't make a mm -hmm. decision in two and a half seconds, none of it's going to matter. But the difference is, is that all the guys that we're talking about that are elite, that have all those physical traits, 
they can also make the decision in two and a half seconds. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah. what, what is he bringing to the table that they aren't? There's nothing that Brock Purdy can do on the football field that Josh Allen can't, that Herbert can't, that Burrow can't, that Lamar can't. There's nothing, literally nothing. But there's a lot that they bring to the table that he doesn't. Now, again, that doesn't mean he can't be a good quarterback. But when you're talking elite, you're talking special. What are you bringing to the table that's special? And the answer, I'm sorry, is nothing. Well, this is a topic, too, that causes a lot of debate, especially on X. Um, and everyone seems to want to challenge you on this as well. So let me just ask you, are you a fan of Brock Purdy? Yeah, I absolutely yeah. am. Yeah, I am. Listen, you, all the mail is out there for you. You can go search up my tweets from 2021. <laughs> Or I'm arguing with everybody knows if if you're if you know 49ers uh, Twitter, you know who Rich Madrid is, right? Mm -hmm. Rich Madrid is a staple in the 49ers Twitter community. He and I, there's threads of me defending Brock Purdy as a college athlete and talking about, listen, man, right now I'm saying it in 2021, Brock Purdy is going to explode on the draft scene, saying it here before anybody else. He's a second or third round pick to me. That was in 2020. That was before he was on the 49ers. Then there's video of me celebrating when he got picked. There's Twitter spaces that are recorded with me celebrating when he got picked. And like, listen, guys, you guys are sleeping on Brock Purdy. I'm just letting you know. So I can like a guy, but also be realistic about him. And again, like we can remove Brock Purdy from it. There's a lot of conversations about me loving CJ Stroud or uh, Jaden Daniels. Not on the 49ers, love those guys, but they need to show me more. You can't, yeah. you don't get to skirt with one good year, an okay year, and then just get paid and think like, ah, this is, this is what you need. Um, so yes, of course, I like Brock Purdy. And on a personal level, we have a lot of things in common as far as our, our religious views and all that. So I, I respect Brock Purdy. I like Brock Purdy. I also don't think he's elite. And that's where the conundrum comes in because. I'm supposed to be a fan, which means you yeah. have to think everybody's the greatest. It's just not the way it works. It, it, it always sparks a, a big debate uh, over on X. So let's talk about their upcoming matchup against the Green Bay Packers. I mean, at this point now, it's become a must win. They're going on the road to Lambeau Field. Uh, I have a stat here that I was like, oh, my God. The 49ers playoff odds per PFF. With a win at Green Bay, it rises to 52%. With a loss, it drops to 15%. Ouch. That's brutal. That's like season over. Good night. Now, we are in a weaker division, but we can't seem to beat these weaker teams. I mean, there are a few, I mean, there are a few plays away from being eight and two. And it's crazy to think about that. You know, when you look at uh the Texans last night, they were seven and four. We could have been six and four. You know, it, it's it's ridiculous how they've lost these games and how they've just given it up. And obviously, look, Devondre Campbell has not really been the right answer. Uh, yes, he had like seven tackles, but I thought against the Seahawks, he didn't look as dynamic. He's not a dynamic player. No. He's just a big linebacker who has some experience, but he's he's no Drew, Drew Greenlaw, that's for sure. Christian McCaffrey is not in mid-season form. It almost seems like he's in preseason form because he hasn't been playing. When he gets the ball, he doesn't have the explosive ability. Now, is it because he's being cautious about his uh, his, his both of his Achilles? Or is it that he's just not really in football shape at the moment because he's only played in two games? It's not like when he was not in these games, he was hitting the turf, running as fast as he can. No, I mean, look. They have some things that they got to show up, but, but here's the thing. Going against the Packers, do you see the Niners being able to get a win in Green Bay? I, I do think they can beat Green Bay. Uh, I don't know that I'm going to pick them to do so, but Green Bay is is beatable themselves. They have their own struggles right now. Um, they Jair lost Alexander, the Bears. Right, correct, correct. Was... Jair Alexander may miss this game. He's a very important piece for them. Uh, Jordan Love is... a there's another guy right here. I mean, maybe the Packers will be very happy that they paid Jordan Love, but we don't know for sure yet on Jordan yeah, Love. Jordan Love has some of the intangibles that maybe Brock doesn't that I've talked about, but he can't protect the football at all. I mean, every game, 
He'll he'll give you three touchdowns, but but he's going to turn the ball over at least once, probably mm-hmm. two, even three times. So he's got to clean that up in his game. The 49ers are going to have their opportunities. They're probably going to force a turnover or two. And I think they can score on Green Bay. They have their flaws. But also, if Bosa doesn't play, I don't know how you're going to get pressure on Jordan Love. You yeah. look at that offensive line. It's one of the higher offensive, higher rated offensive lines and pass protection already. So if you don't have Bosa and you don't blitz, I don't know how you're going to get pressure on him. And if Jordan Love can just camp back there, it's going to be a problem. So I don't know that I'll pick the 49ers, but certainly, yes, they can beat the Packers. The Packers are a beatable team right now. I believe that. And the last question, as we wrap things up on the, our segment for the 49ers, we're talking to Jesse Naylor, host of Last Second Sports. You can follow him on YouTube, Instagram, and X. Is this season salvageable? Do you think Kyle Shanahan and the coaching staff, the team, can salvage this season? Or do you think it may be time to look towards next season? I said in the offseason that I would tear the team down. I, I would wow. I would have done it this last offseason because the likelihood of you winning a Super Bowl was slim to none. And the longer you hang on to these contracts and these aging players, the the further back you're setting the franchise that you're turning the keys over to Brock Purdy. You're handing it over to these young guys. It's going to be a lot harder to build around them if you hang on to the Debo's and the Kittles and the Trents and the CMCs. But I knew the 49ers wouldn't do that. I then made the claim again after the Chiefs game. I knew they weren't going to do it still, but I was like, hey, just remember, I did say this. Can they salvage the season? What, what does that mean? Salvage the season to me means... Can you make the playoffs? And the answer is yes, but they're going to have to go bare minimum five and two down the stretch. None of those losses. They can't lose to green Bay. They can't lose to the Rams and they can't lose to the Cardinals. They have to for sure win those three and pick up two more along the way. And then they need some help as well to win the division because right now, as it stands, the Cardinals have four division games remaining. They have zero losses. So even if the 49ers and the Cardinals end up with the same record and the 49ers beat them in week 18, unless the Cardinals lost twice more in the two Seattle games and the Rams game, it's not going to matter. They'll still own the tiebreaker. Mm-hmm. That game will mean nothing to the Cardinals. So they, we need, as 49er fans, need to hope that the Cardinals lose twice between the two Seahawks games and the Rams game. And then if the 49ers can beat them in week 18 and pick up wins along the way, they have a chance, but they need a lot of help. It's not likely, but it is possible. The 49ers are currently have the second worst divisional record in the NFC ahead of only the New York Giants. That's brutal. Wow. <laughs> what has happened to this team? We'll see how it plays out the rest of the season. Jesse, I want to thank you so much for coming on here and talking Niners. We'll have to do it again. Where can everyone find you and, and all your content? Uh, you can just find me at Last Second Sports. Check me out there or on X at JNA underscore LSS. Andre, thank you so much for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. Absolutely.